The following program is exclusively produced and distributed by Dick Denman's Double D Productions, Inc., all rights reserved. Hi, Golden Age film fanatics, and welcome to DVD Classics Corner on the Air. My name is Dick Dinman, and our goal is to become your exclusive guide to the very best of the Golden Age classics coming out on DVD. We'll have reviews, breaking news of upcoming releases, plenty of surprise guests, and a special feature devoted to the great Golden Age film composers, which we call Cine Music. So let's turn on the marquee and lights... Camera, action. It's time for Dick's Picks, in which I get to shine the spotlight on one of my Dick's Picks of the week. There are many reasons that the Criterion Collection has earned their reputation as the Tiffany of home video outfits. One is the fact that the pristine visual and oral quality of all their releases is a given. The other is the fact that they remain incomparably selective of which titles they'll release on DVD and Blu-ray. To illustrate, just listen to this list of my favorite recent Criterion releases. Not one, but two of Preston Sturge's brilliant comedy classics The Palm Beach Story and Sullivan's Travels. Leo McCary's rarely seen and heart-rending Make Way for Tomorrow, Nicholas Rogue's hauntingly erotic Don't Look Now, possibly the finest family film ever made, The Black Stallion, Charlie Chaplin's poignant late-career masterpiece, Limelight, two of my favorite Francois Truffaut masterworks, The Soft Skin and Day for Night, And what a bonanza for film noir fanatics. Titles to dream about that are now a reality. Ride the Pink Horse. Carol Reed's Odd Man Out. Not one but two versions of Ernest Hemingway's The Killers in one amazing collection. The Friends of Eddie Coyle which features what many consider Robert Mitchum's finest performance. And to top this gallery of noir greats is what I consider the most brazenly electrifying film noir of all time, Jules Dassin's Night and the City, which I guarantee will get a grip on you from frame one to its violent conclusion and never let you go. Every single one of these Criterion Collection classics are available now at your local video emporium or online, even as we speak. Stay tuned for more Dick's Picks. Coming up on DVD Classics Corner on the air very soon. And today, I salute the Criterion Collection's stunning Blu-ray release of Jules Dassin's monumentally intense descent into darkness, Night and the City, which stars Richard Widmark in what is unquestionably his finest performance. And my treasured returning guest is author Glenn Erickson, whose website, DVD Savant, is my single favorite film classic review site and whose commentary track on Criterion's Night in the City is just one of the highlights of this terrific release. Glenn Erickson, welcome back to DVD Classics Corner. After too long an absence, it's wonderful to have you back. I'm happy to be back here as well. A very special occasion, Criterion's... 4K restoration of one of our very favorite films, Night and the City. And among the wonderful special features on this uh, Blu-ray is commentary by someone who you may be fairly intimately familiar with, someone named Glenn Erickson. Does that ring a bell? That is me indeed. Your commentary, as usual, is excellent and and comprehensive. And today I happen to go on your website, which, by the way, is my favorite 
classic reviewing website, DVD Savant, and what do I see but a review of Night in the City, of which you are understandably very enthusiastic. Now, my question to you is, what is it about Night in the City that strikes you as so special? Well, among, among all those film noir movies, it's the one that uh, scared me the most. When I was an impressionable student, it was, it's so uh, negative uh, about life and about ambition and trying to make it in the world. It gives such a distorted picture of what, uh, of what competition and ambition is like that it, you know, it, it became very frightening to me when I was like 19 years old in film school. Really? I saw it when I was six years old oh. uh, on television, and it, it, it terrified me. Uh, I wasn't able to look at it until I was in my uh, 20s or even 30s, and I kind of avoided it <laughs> because it created such a dark uh, impression on me. But by that time, I'd become such a huge Richard Widmark fan that I, I looked at it again. It's... Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you where I place it. I, I think film noir covers a lot of bases, the term film noir. For me, there is a special genre called loser nightmare noir. Yes. <laughs> and I would put the Prowler act of violence, try and get me odd man out, and force of evil in that category. But the bleakest, the darkest, and yet the most thrilling in, in an offbeat way for me is Night and the City. It seems to revel in its pessimism and darkness. It, I can't describe why this f film is so exhilarating. Can you? It is the way it looks. It's the way it's stylized. And it's really the powerful, powerful performances by this uh, group of actors led by Richard Widmark. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you that when I uh, started at UCLA, I was almost afraid to go into the building very much, but then the archive, the brand new UCLA film archive, opened an office, and they had Bob Gitt there sometimes, but he usually worked somewhere else. And the man in charge was an associate professor named Bob Epstein, Robert Epstein, and he started bringing us in to see, to look at what was in the uh, Fox collection on a Steenbeck they had there in the archive. And we saw a bunch of movies that uh, he said were called film noirs. And we go, what? You know, uh -huh. the, the term in 1971 uh, that really wasn't talked about very much. And he finally showed us this on the Steenbeck. It was a, a nitrate print, you know. I think he was even smoking there in the office, you know, showing this thing on the Steenbeck. Oh. And, uh, you know, it was just quite a knockout. Even on the Steenbeck screen, you could see that it was photographed much better than almost anything else we'd seen. It was very, very uh, arresting. Uh, every, every scene had this impact, and every scene was directed and performed at a higher level of energy and tension. What's especially exciting about this Criterion Blu-ray is that, I believe, for the very first time, two complete different versions, the British and the American of Night in the City, are available. And that, to me, is very, very exciting. I watched both, and uh, the differences are extraordinary. I have to ask you, which version do you prefer and why? Oh, the original American version, uh, the one we've seen much, much better, the I think the English version, you know, some somebody, you know, some very uh, sensitive person got a hold of it and either reshot some things or wanted to soften some things down so that uh, Harry would be a nicer guy and the story wouldn't be quite so bleak. And I think it, it's much better when it's, uh, you know, straight acid instead of with some water in it. Well, for me, the differences are many. It, it's stunning. It's, it, it's a stunning lesson in how much a great score can contribute to a film. And the American version has 
a tingling score from Franz Waxman, who at the time was at his height, having won, I believe, by that time, two Oscars in a row for Sunset Boulevard and A Place in the Sun. Okay. So uh, he was at his very height, and the the score is, is brilliant. On the other hand, in the British version, the Frankel, Benjamin Frankel score, seems wan and weak by comparison. Wouldn't, wouldn't just, you agree? Yes, it just seems sort of, you know, a little syrupy and a little like, you know, oh, it's, it's a sad story happening here, but it doesn't electrify the movie the way the Waxman thing does. Now, what about the scenes? Because there there are a few added scenes in the, well, the British uh, version. I wish that one of them would have been retained. I think I know which one. Which one? Uh, the kissing scene. No. No. The kissing scene in the doorway. Which one do you wish was retained? The one that I wish was retained was the scene where the hotel manager is handing Widmark's Harry Fabian the bill. Right, okay, be- why? Simply because it adds to the stakes. Uh, it adds to his desperation. It adds, an, you know, yet another level, as if we really needed it. But to me, it should be there. I th- there there's an earlier scene where Harry Fabian demonstrates his new, uh, t- to Gene Tierney, his new um, gimmick. Gasoline thing? Uh, gasoline thing. And that, for me, is extraneous only because Widmark's performance is <laughs> so incredibly full that it's actually unnecessary. But that one scene with the hotel manager, I would have kept in. You obviously disagree with that. Well, the scene of the hotel manager basically allows Harry to... Uh, explain uh, his character, why he, you know, wants to be... He, he has a little speech there where he talks about, you know, his desires, his ambitions, and, you've, you know, trying to be more sympathetic. And most of the English version changes that I see in the movie are trying to make Harry more sympathetic. And I think the less sympathetic and raw Harry is, the better. Uh, the reason that Harry, in the English version, the reason Harry uh, cheats um, the Googie Withers uh, character out of her money is to pay that hotel bill, and in the American version, it's just for you know, it's it's just for the uh, the operation of his club or to to buy off the Strangler or something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the hotel bill is is you know, it's it's kind of I think it's the the idea he's got a problem with the hotel is sort of extraneous. Uh, I like it better when all you know about Harry is that he's just so proud of having a sign outside his window and. A, sign in his desk with his name on it. That's all he cares about. (laughs) What happened is that in like 1976, a friend of mine wanted, I I had worked at the UCLA uh, uh, Film Arts Reading Room in in the library there, and a friend of mine in New York wanted to sell a huge collection of MGM uh, scripts and wanted a buyer. And I arranged that sale and as part, and he sent these huge boxes of scripts over, and I hauled them into UCLA to, to, to complete the transaction. And among them was a script for Night in the City. And unlike the other ones, it wasn't an MGM script, it was a Fox script, so I kept it. And I kept it because it was an original script with different colored pages, and it had these notes in it from Daryl F. Zanuck about how he had changed the movie. And what I saw is that a bunch of these scenes had been oh, the the opening and part of the closing were were Daryl Zanuck changes, and the rest of the and in this script were all of the English uh, version scenes as well. Hmm. So I simply thought that they were cut out, and that the beginning had been replaced. I never knew that there was an English version until much much later. And the huge improvement to me done by Daryl Zanuck to the American version is that Harry Fabian is not sympathetic. In the English version, when uh, he's in Mary, Helen's room, when he's in Helen's room in the beginning, with, uh, in the English version, he looks like, oh, I'm a sad fellow, Helen doesn't understand me, you know, she mm-hmm. only realized I had a good idea here. You know, he's, he's you know, a softy, sort of. But in the American version, 
when she tries to be nice to him, he pouts and sulks and looks the other way. He's angry at her the whole time for not immediately swallowing his stupid idea, you know, <laughs> for this get-rich-quick scheme. So I find the American uh, version is a much more interesting character because Harry, and, uh, cause, cause Harry Fabian is so much more unlikable. You know, as a rule, you might expect the opposite. Exactly. Uh, because on so many occasions, the overseas version is vastly superior to exactly. the American version. So we really have to give a tremendous amount of credit to, to Daryl F. Zanuck on many levels, and we'll discuss them after this very brief station break. We pause now for station identification. DVD Classics Corner on the Air is exclusively produced and released by Dick Denman's Double D Productions, Inc. All rights reserved. And we're back with Glenn Erickson talking about Criterion's magnificent release on Blu-ray of Night and the City. Getting back to Daryl Zanuck, this particular film shows a side, an almost benevolent, caring side on many levels of Daryl F. Zanuck that you, you don't generally see because he was very tough in many, many ways. First of all, his protection, if, you, if that's the correct word, of the, the director, Jules Vassin, who was about to be blacklisted, and the fact that he sent him to England to do this film, despite the threat of blacklisting, is, is to me a testament to, to the courage uh, of Zanuck. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, definitely. Uh, Zanuck was a, you know, a great supporter of his writers. He could be really rough in his actors, and he kept someone like Tyrone Power in a, a vice grip of what he was going to perform in for 20 years, it seemed. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, he, was, he considered himself a writer. He was protective of writers, and he was particularly protective of some of the writers who were, got in trouble with the blacklist. And before he tried, he, he thought that uh, Dassin was the greatest. I think it's Dassin, Dassin, Dassin. Dassin was the greatest and wanted to protect him more than anybody else. And he invented a movie when, when Dassin came under suspicion in like 1948, 49. He invented a movie to be filmed in San Francisco written by Albert Maltz. And he was, the idea was that they would get this film halfway done before the New York office found out about it. And then the New York office would have to let it be finished. Mm -hmm. Because... Zanuck made no bones about it. He said he would defend all of his writers until the New York office, you know, clamped down on him, at which point he wouldn't be able to defend him. So everything he did was to hide his activities from the New York office and Mr. Skouris. Anyway, they started filming this movie up in San Francisco, and Albert, and it was supposed to be in secret, and Albert Maltz uh, held a press conference saying that the blacklist was broken and that he and Jules Dassin were working on a new movie. Oh. Which of course crashed that whole thing. That the whole the movie stopped that very same day. You know, everyone was screaming at Albert Malt. And uh Skouris said Skouris actually called up uh Dassin and said, I'm going to step on your neck. Whoa. <laughs> and apparently Zanuck told Dassin to go to uh to London immediately and he would try to figure out some movie for him to be made there. So Night in the City was invented specifically for uh, Jules Dassin to film in London. Uh, as prepared, the script is originally going to be, you know, take place in New York or something. Well, and further evidence of Zanuck's benevolence, if you will, is the fact that he found a role, a very, as far as I'm concerned, inappropriate role for Fox star Gene Tierney, who was beginning to unravel uh, mentally. Yes. I and have a story on that, too. Yes? She, uh, it's, it could be because of, they said it was because of a romantic problem, 
but it also could have been because of her child uh, who was uh, had a um, birth defect because of a, a terrible tragedy, which is a different story entirely. Mm -hmm. But she was beginning to get very depressed, and it also might have been part of her uh, uh, nervous breakdown mental illness situation which was starting to creep up. But because she was so depressed, Zanuck invented the idea of having her go over to London and play in this very lightweight, you know, non-stress uh, uh, movie yeah. to, 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 to give her a break and to get her out of town. Apparently she wanted to avoid the people she, she, was, she was staying with. So they invented this Helen character for her. In the, in the Kirsch book, Helen is sort of this virtuous girl who becomes a, uh, a nightclub tout, or what do you want to call what she does at that nightclub where she forces people to, uh, or tricks men into spending all their money. And she becomes totally corrupted. And it's, she's, you know, it's, she's a sad story. There's, everybody's really sick in the, in the book. But in the movie, of course, she, she stays true blue and sweet and just doesn't seem to understand Harry, which unfortunately doesn't make her seem very bright. It seems to me kind of a derailment of her, of her career. Zanuck was, in a way, sort of hard at his actresses. And uh, there's like the actress from Fallen Angel, uh, who was a huge uh, Fox star. Alice Faye. Alice Faye, yeah. who he sort of abandoned yeah. and let her career slide and lost interest in her. And it seemed the same thing in a way, you know, although he kept on giving her roles, seemed to, be, seemed to happen to Jean Tierney. I, I think Jean Tierney is very attractive in the movie. She's, you know, she's always a positive element in any picture. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that I think doesn't quite work or add up is that uh, Harry Fabian just seems to have no interest in her whatsoever except as a source of revenue or a place to sleep when he needs a place to hide. And, you know, she, you know, is, she persists in having this romantic attraction to him and wanting to save him and having this entire illusion about what he is and what he does, which also does, doesn't add up because they're both in such a sleazy racket mm -hmm. and, and uh, her character shouldn't be quite so virtuous, but... That's a very minor flaw in a movie that just hits you over the head every five minutes with something amazing. Oh, <laughs> no question <laughs> about it. I do feel, though, that Hugh Marlowe, who uh, also plays a supporting role in, in the film as Gene Tierney's uh, wished-for wished boyfriend, um, must have thought after two terrific performances in 12 O'Clock High and All About Eve that, whoops, there goes my, my film career. Because almost, yes. Almost, because from that point on, he was relegated to fairly, I, I think, embarrassing, you know, jerky roles in monkey business and <laughs> the day yes. the earth stood still. Well, it's pretty sad because in the, the, the English version, of course, has many more, uh, at least four or five more scenes with him and Gene Tierney, building them up as the romantic couple who, you know, an alternative to Harry Fabian, which has nothing to do with the story and is total, uh, you know, don't need to see it. It's a distraction. Mm -hmm. And when he's cut out of the film he, uh, for the American version, which is better, he's very effective in his couple roles. He has the famous line where he calls Harry Fabian an artist without an art. Mm -hmm. He does quite well with that. But at the same time, you think, you know, well, does, you know, we really want to see, do we really want to see Gene Tierney get together with a toy maker and sculptor. He seems like kind of a, you know, a guy who can't even cook spaghetti. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Even very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's not the kind of role that uh, that uh, an actor who just had two terrific roles in two great Fox, Fox films uh, would have hoped for. Well, uh, that's why I say that I think Zanuck was was wonderful with writers and directors, and c could be pretty hard on actors. Yes, he certainly could. I've spoken to a lot of actors about Zanuck. I've spoken to Alice Faye. I've spoken to John Payne, to Mark Stevens, and uh, none of them uh, think of Zanuck with any kind of uh, uh, affection. Well, he was a story man, and he wanted those actors to fit into the slots in his stories and you know, and the only way he figured he could make that happen was to, uh, to, to you know, to, to push them around as much as he could. Frankly, I consider Zanuck to be quite possibly of of all of the 
studio heads at the time, uh, the most creative and brilliant. I guess we're learning that he uh, contributed a great deal to many supposedly classic John Ford movies we like. Including the, the ending for uh, The Grapes of Wrath, which was his right. entirely mm-hmm. and, and works beautifully. Uh, on the other hand, <laughs> according to, to Dessin, Zanuck basically destroyed Thieves Highway. Thieves Highway with that ending, and uh, and I tend to agree with him. It makes cool. n- you know no sense for for the Richard Conte character to, <laughs> to go off with Valentino Cortez. Well, well, Dick, I look at it this way: about twenty percent of film noirs of that time are political, and almost every one of them has this through line of a story you can see exactly where it's going, and then all of a sudden in the last scene. Something changes where it looks like there's a reshoot mm-hmm. or a rewriting mm-hmm. or a total redirection of a scene, and they just you know paste some you know tapioca on top of this mean story to make it have a nice ending. And that happens so many times that that I'm so I'm so used to it that when I watch those movies, I just discount those scenes entirely. Well, it happens all the time. You're right. In Asphalt Jungle, there's a, 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 a suddenly a scene where John McIntyre is talking about how valuable and essential the police are, and I run that movie constantly by cutting that scene out because it's totally unnecessary. And even Thieves Highway has a scene with the police, you know, uh, in in the bar at the end, uh, 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 which doesn't fit at all. Yeah, it's completely false. Completely. Completely false. Well, you could almost you could almost say that Night in the City, the English version, has the same thing with a farewell on the bridge that oh. makes it seem like, well, you know, the person you've been watching for the last two hours is you know drowning fifteen feet away, but our young lovers have a hopeful future walking you know into the sun sunrise. <laughs> right, right. It, it, it's very true. And guess what, Glenn? We are out of time, and we haven't even begun to discuss the incredible performances in in this brilliant film. I want to ask you whether you would be kind enough to return next week to discuss the careers of Richard Widmark as well as the performances of all the supporting players in Night in the City. Well, of course, that sounds like fun. Great. Well, we'll see you next week on DVD Classics Corner on the air. Well, that's my show for today. DVD Classics Corner on the Air is conceived, written, produced, and directed by me, Double D. And if you'd like to hear some of my older, vintage shows, please go to www.dvdclassicscorner.net, where in addition to the broadcasts, you'll find hundreds of my print reviews of classic DVD releases. So, until next week... Keep well, keep happy, and keep listening.